Shalom Aleichem. I'm Ann Toback, the CEO of the Workers' Circle. Welcome to the second of our three-part series exploring issues of systemic racism in the United States through the lens of historic moments in Yiddish culture. Thank you to all of our co-sponsors. It's so important in these critical times for organizations to connect to explore our past and use our learnings to help us collectively engage in the hard work of social and economic justice activism and overcoming systemic racism today. I am thrilled we are joined in this program by so many strong partners, and I hope we can continue to build on our collective strength well into the future. For those of you who are new to the Worker Circle, we're a social justice organization that builds progressive Jewish identity through Jewish culture, Yiddish language, multi-generational education, and all together we collectively act in campaigns for economic justice, immigrant and worker rights, and as a partner in the national movement to end systemic racism in the United States. I'm excited now to be introducing the producer and moderator for our In the Midst series, Anthony Russell. Anthony is a vocalist, a composer, and arranger, spe specializing in music in the Yiddish language. His work in traditional Ashkenazi Jewish musical forms led to a musical exploration of his own ethnic roots through the research, arrangement, and performance of 100 years of African-American roots music, resulting in the EP Convergence, a collaboration with the klezmer band Varetsky Pass. An essayist in a number of publications, including Jewish Currents and Moment Magazine, Anthony lives in Massachusetts with his husband of five years, Rabbi Michael Rothbaum. Welcome to our program and welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Anne, and good evening. My name is Anthony Mordechai Svi Russell, and this is Familiarity in Distance, Yosef Keller's Vinichvolt in Alabama Zine the second program of a Worker's Circle three-part series entitled In the Midst, an exploration of systemic racism in the US through the magnifying, refracting, and reflecting lens of Yiddish culture. Because of the volume of interest in interacting with our guests during the last program, we'd like to invite those with questions for our guests to save them for an informal Q&A session immediately following tonight's program at approximately 8.15 PM Eastern time. Amid the international protests that arose last year in the wake of the murders of, among countless other Black victims, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, I received a notification on Facebook Messenger the first week of June from the poet and translator Maya Ivrona, who wanted to share with me her translation of a poem she described as historically important, but also pretty dated. Written in 1965 by a Yiddish poet in the USSR, it was in response to the historic protests and marches of the Birmingham campaign of 1963. Tonight, we are joined by our guests, poet, writer, and translator, Maya Ivrona's translation of Yosef Kehler's work was awarded with a 2019 Yiddish Book Center Translation Fellowship, recipient of fellowships for her translation of Avram Sutskever from the National Endowment for the Arts and the American Literary Translators Association, her work has been supported by the inaugural joint Spain-Greece Fulbright Scholar Award. She's joined by PhD in Comparative Literature from Stanford University and Master of Studies from Oxford University, Amelia Glazer, an award-winning translator, author, and associate professor of Russian and Comparative Literature at the University of California, San Diego. Her book, Songs in Dark Times, Yiddish Poetry of Struggle from Scottsboro to Palestine, was published recently by Harvard University Press. We will now hear the poem Vinchvot in Alabama Zine by Yosef Kehler from Amelia in the original Yiddish, immediately followed by Maya's English translation of the poem. Amelia. All right. Vinchvot in Alabama Zine. Kein Birmingham will take rein. A rein geschnitten sich in meat. Ich muss erzählt ein Neger sein, sie ist wenig mehr, was ich bin jed. Ritt sich ein Tempe auf dem Tam, ich hab euch nicht einmal schön versucht, wie es heint mit Chalef, Gift und Flamme, der Teut nach Elgetz wo mich sucht. Nur 
Nicht gebrochen ist mein, Schma mein Spann, mit soren dicken Hass ich spei, auf Rassenhass, auf Ku Klux Klan, und stell sich brüderisch getrei, mit schwarze und mit weißer Leid, dem Teu an Kegen, kein Mol nicht, nicht umgekehrt wird sein die Zeit, wenn Mensch verheie hot geknit, in Alabama, wenn ich bin jetzt in same Koch von dem Geschleg, ich wollt durchgebrochen wie ein Blitz, zu dir, mein Negerfreund, a weg. Mein Heut ist weiß und deine schwarz, nur offen, Bruder, is für dir mein Herz. Is Fäust zu Fäust, is Glied zu Glied, ein Luft bei uns, ein Pein, ein Schein, es ist wenig mir, was ich bin jed. Ich muss nach euch ein Neger sein. And Maya, if you would give us your translation of this poem in English. If I were in Alabama, I would go to Birmingham, making my way through the midst. Now, I must be a black man. It's not enough that I am a Jew. Fury tempered on the tongue. I have tasted more than once, even today with butcher's knife, poison and flame. Death still searches for me any place. But my stride is unbroken. With furious hatred, I spit on racism, on the Ku Klux Klan, and I rise faithful in brotherhood with white and with black against death. Never again. Time will not be turned back to when people kneeled before animals. If I were now in Alabama, in the pure commotion of the fight, I would make my way like a lightning bolt through to you, my black friend. My skin is white and yours is dark, but before you, brother, open is my heart. So fist is with fist, as is limb with limb, one breath between us, one anguish, one light. It's not enough that I am a Jew. I must be a black man too. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading and translation of the poem. In our last program, we discussed a dramatic depiction of the Scottsboro Boys trial on the avant-garde Yiddish stage. Amelia, in the contemporary world of Yiddish poetry, what were the kinds of engagements it had as a genre with the phenomenon of racism in the United States? Thanks so much for this question. And I know that we have a few images to show. Um, and I, I, I just wanted to thank you, Anthony, for putting this together. Um, I really love this poem and, um, and I appreciate so much that Maya has translated it into English along with other works by Joseph Kehler. I wanted to also give a shout out. I noticed in the participants that Joseph Kehler's son, Dov Bear Kehler is in the audience. Um, Dov Bear was my advisor when I did my master's degree at Oxford and um, we've consulted a little bit about the poem over the last few days. Uh, so the poem to me cuts to the heart of a long standing question for Jews who are seeking social justice in the United States. And this, this includes today, um, but it goes back at least a century and, and, and more arguably. How can a person begin to gain a sense of someone else's pain? And as Yosef Kerler asks in this poem, is it enough to be a Jew? And he answers that it isn't. One must also become at least metaphorically black. One must cut to the center of the crowd in Birmingham and join the struggle. And this is a poem that was written in the 1960s, um, but they're questions that Jews and others continue to ask. In fact, just a couple of years ago, as many probably recall, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez was criticized for comparing border detention centers to concentration camps. So we're still thinking about, you know, what is the comparison? Can we talk about Jewish pain as something that's translatable or is it unique? And, and Carroller argues in this poem, that we have to translate it. It's necessary to translate it. Uh, so the, the poem was written in the Soviet Union in the 1960s, and it's written in Yiddish. And Carroller is explicitly identifying as Jewish. 
but he's also nodding as he's doing this to Jewish historical struggles, which was not something that was completely kosher in the Soviet 1960s, right? You weren't supposed to talk about it, the, the uniquely Jewish experience of past pain. But on the other hand, it's written in a tradition of leftist Yiddish speaking solidarity with black struggles in the United States. And it localizes East European experiences of struggle, of pain, to describe the pain of other people. So I wanted to give just a very brief overview of a little bit of the history of Yiddish literature about Black Americans. And I'll go back to the Scottsboro trial, which I know was the subject of the last conversation uh, in this series. So we'll sort of pick up where, uh, where we left off last time. And um, those who attended the last event know something about the Scottsboro trial. This was an event that mobilized the left in the United States um, in the early 1930s and 1931, nine young black men, very young, you know, the oldest I think was about 19, were hoboing across the South. They were riding atop this train car and a fight broke out. And the long and the short of it was that um, these men were accused wrongly of having raped two white women who were also um, riding atop that, um, that train car. The women later confessed that they had been lying, that these men had not raped them. Um, but the trial went on, the last one was acquitted in 2013. This dragged on for decades, for nearly a century. And in the 1930s, there was a wave of poems about Scottsboro, um, especially in English among African American poets, but there was also a large group of left wing Yiddish poets who redoubled their efforts to write about racism in America, to write about lynchings and so forth. These were not the first poems about lynchings to appear in Yiddish, uh, but there was a, a major wave of them in the early 1930s. And um, one of the things that I've noticed, and I've written a little bit about this, is that many of these writers were translating their experience of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe to encompass experiences of white racism in the United States. And in my book, I use the term passwords to identify terms that are uh, ways of shifting a conversation about Jews to a conversation about other groups of people. So I'll just give just a couple of examples. Uh, I think we have Malka Lee's poem, God's Black Lamb. There we go. I don't know if, uh, there we go. Um, this is just an excerpt from this poem, but it's a, it's a poem by Malka Lee published in 1932. It does not explicitly mention the Scottsboro case, but it's about a lynching in the American South. Uh, so it, it begins, they led him outside with bare feet and bound hands, his skin burnt by Southern sand, his flesh became suddenly oily, his black body sparkled in tears, the woods bent low as if from a knife wound, go back, go back, God's black lamb tore himself from the rope. I'll just read those last two lines in Yiddish. Gott's schwarzer Lam hat sich gerissen von Strick. The poem goes on from there, but what I find Lee is doing in this poem is, is drawing from a poetic tradition of casting a Jew in the role of Jesus, of a suffering Jesus, as a way of talking about pogrom violence. And Lee instead casts a black man in that role of the suffering Jesus. So this, this modernist trope of Christological pogrom poems becomes a new 1930s trope of Christological uh, anti-racist poems. And I'll give another example quickly, uh, if we could have maybe the next slide. There we go. Um, this is a poem by Barish Weinstein, which I was realizing today as I went over these slides that I, I first found this poem when I was working with Dove Bear Carler very appropriately at Oxford. I, I still have these lovely memories of trying to parse uh, Weinstein's turns of phrase in Dove Bear's office at Oxford. Uh, but this is just the very beginning and the very end of the poem that does something very similar. Weinstein is taking a Christological motif and translating it from a motif about pogroms to a motif about lynchings. He opens it, a Negro in the middle of the field bleeds beneath a bright blade. And I'll read that line in Yiddish because it's, it's important. A Nagel in Mittenfeld, blutigt unter an Helen Messel, staubt in a Thomas Tog, 
for Nechesen Chalif, Hesen Chalif, dies one Tammuz day by a hot slaughtering knife. Every blade of grass, every branch glints spear-like off the sharp metal. And for those that were paying close attention, the, uh, the poem by Yosef Kerler also includes a chalif, this, um, this slaughtering knife, which is a, a, a term from Jewish tradition. This is what a Jewish ritual slaughterer would use to, uh, to create kosher meat. And uh, Weinstein also uses the month, the Jewish month of the calendar, Tammuz, which basically inscribes the lynching that's being portrayed here within Jewish time. So it's a Jewish context for a, uh, a racist crime in America. Um, I'll go ahead and, and continue to some of the next poems that I wanted to talk about just to, in the interest of time. Uh, but what I wanted to show is that the seeking of solidarity between Jews and Black Americans um, is, is very strong in the 1930s. This begins to fade away by the end of World War II for very obvious reasons. A, a large wave of Jews who had become leftists in the 1920s and 1930s started to retreat into, um, into a, a, a certain insularity again. The Holocaust meant that Jews needed to think about what it meant to be Jewish again, needed to pull together as a community and think about one's own suffering. And you have a lot of, of writers who had become internationalists and had written about other groups who stopped doing that. Um, but things start to change in the 1950s and 60s with the civil rights movement. And at this point, many writers start to see in the Holocaust an opportunity to, again, translate an experience of Jewish trauma to an experience that Black Americans were facing again in the United States. So if we could actually, we'll, we'll go ahead to the next slide as well. I won't address all of the poems that I, that I thought I was going to, although we can always come back to them in the Q&A. Um, we can skip this one as well. <laughs> I put lots on there just in case, and this one. Well, we can go back to these. These were a few, I included a few extra slides in case we wanted to talk about some of the borrowings by Yiddish writers from African-American poetry. Uh, but I wanted to just quick, quickly mention that, oh no, no, go back, the one before, the title by poem. Thank you, perfect. So uh, I wanted to quickly mention that it was really the civil rights moment that uh, reintroduced a poetics of writing about other groups again in large scale into Yiddish literature. And so you have, um, you have poets like Dora Teitelboim, who you see here, starting to write about things like the integration of schools with her Ballad of Little Rock. And this was a poem that was written in Yiddish. It was actually a quite long poem, a book length poem that was written in Yiddish and translated quite quickly into a lot of other languages, including Russian. It was published in a Soviet edition. And I'll just read in English for you this, this one stanza from the poem, Black children used to the lives of gloom and need. Tomorrow in my country, you'll bring joy to birth. When at one feast, all humankind shall feed. And as in heaven, every star will blaze on earth. So this poem is written in the late 50s. And the idea is that finally, we are, into, we are seeing integration in the United States and all will be much better. And this was greeted by um, you know, intense excitement, not only in the US, but also around the world. Uh, so what, what I've identified in some of this poetry of the interwar period of the 1930s is that you have writers who are shifting their concept of what us means in their poetry. They're taking these poems and even these words that are particular to Jewishness and translating those to words that can mean solidarity with other groups, whether with all workers of the world or with a specific other group that is facing a struggle. So when Barish Weinstein uses this, uh, you know, this, this Jewish month in his poem about a lynching, Tammuz, he's bringing his African-American protagonist into Jewish time. Uh, and we start to see that happening again with the civil rights movement and movements. And this is something that's not unique to the United States. Uh, and I wanted to just end by sharing one more poem that's written around the same time as Yosef Kerler's. This is Aaron Kortz's Kaddish. And Aaron Kortz had been one of the biggest, you know, Leninist, Stalinist, flag-waving uh, leftist poets 
of the interwar period. And he was really the exception that proved the rule. He remained a party member even after World War II, even with the revelation of Stalin's atrocities. He wrote a happy birthday poem to Stalin in 1949. Uh, but he, he writes this poem in 1963 that starts to weave together the Jewish pain of the Holocaust with the civil rights and with the struggles of African Americans. And I'll just read a, a short excerpt of this as well. This is from 63. The poem is called Kaddish. Yiskadal v'yiskadash, face to face with Abe Lincoln, face to face with the Negro martyred people, a rabbi says Kaddish. I am not a Kaddish sayer. But today, mamas the world over bitterly wept and mourned the four little black girls. I responded to the rabbi's Kaddish, Omein. So we see something happening here, and it's absolutely fine to do this in the US. Nobody's going to tell Aaron Quartz uh, that he can't write about the Holocaust, uh, write about the unique suffering of Jews in the 1960s. Um, but you see something happening, which is this equation of mourning of, of a specific Jewish community mourning to black mourning, to black mourning over the entire experience of injustice from slavery to lynchings, uh, to the, the struggles that were, um, that were deposed in the South for civil rights in the 1960s. Um, I'll go ahead and, and stop there because I, I have lots more to say, but we can we can bring it back in the in the Q and A session. But that hopefully gives a little bit of context internationally to Carler's poem. Thank you so much. It's very illuminating. I have like a thousand questions I want to ask you immediately, um, based on those wonderful selections of work that you brought us. Maya, I was wondering if you could acquaint us with who Yosef Keller was and what were the circumstances that led him to write this particular poem? Yes, and I also want to say a uh, shalom aleichem to Dov Bear, if he's in the audience. Um, he obviously could, knows his father's history better than I do. And he's been such an enormous help uh, with translating this poem and giving me a very important background on his father's work. Um, Yosef Kerler was born in 1918 in Ukraine. Um, he was educated in Yiddish language schools and served with the Red Army during World War II. And his first book of poetry uh, consisted of poems, uh, war poems. Following the, the war, he moved to Birobijan. Um, and around that time, uh, caught the attention of the KGB. Um, and was eventually arrested and served five years in the Vorkuta Gulag, which is north of the Arctic Circle. That was from about 1950 to 1955, which meant that he was in the Gulag um, on the night of the murdered poets, um, which I'm sure uh, is familiar to people in our audience, but was when um, many prominent Jewish writers were murdered. Following his release, he became an early refusenik, uh, trying to leave the Soviet Union for Israel. Um, during that time, he was unable to publish his poetry in Yiddish, um, and he often worked as a lyricist, or he published his work in Russian translation, um, or he published it abroad. Um, and so that means that <laughs> this poem actually um, was not published until Kerler reached Israel in the 1970s. Um, and we should note that um, the poem is very clearly um, a response to a very famous poem by Evgeny Yevtushenko about Bebi Yar, and Kerler was a bit of a mentor to Yevtushenko. Um, I think we have a slide of part of this poem that we were going to show. Yes, so you can see particularly at the end um, that interplay between saying, uh, I'm a Jew and that makes me a true Russian. Kerler plays on this in the, um, in if I were now in Alabama, but in his poem, it's it's different because it's, it's that, it's not enough that I am a Jew, I have to be a black man too. Um, so I, we thought that it was important that the viewers of this program um, see this poem. I can read it if you want. Would you like that? 
Yes, please. Thank you. No monument stands over Babiya, a drop sheer as a crude gravestone. I am afraid. Today I, I am as old in years as all the Jewish people. Now I seem to be a Jew. Here I plod through ancient Egypt. Here I perish crucified on the cross. And to this day, I bear the scars of nails. I seem to be Dreyfus, the Philistine, is both informer and judge. I am behind bars, beset on every side, hounded, spat on, slandered. I am every child here shot dead. Nothing in me shall ever forget. The Internationale, let it thunder when the last anti-Semite on earth is buried forever. In my blood, there is no Jewish blood. In their callous rage, all anti-Semites must hate me now as a Jew. For that reason, I am a true Russian. It's interesting how much of an echo there is between certain lines of this poem and, and lines in the um, Nichbolt in Alabama Zion that almost in some ways kind of mere images of each other. It feels almost painfully obvious to state that the Holocaust was a considerable presence in Yiddish poetry in the post-war period, but I'm curious if you two could address whether and how it might have impacted writing about American racism in Yiddish poetry. I know you've already done that to some degree, but I'm, I'm curious if you can kind of fill that out a little bit more. Should I start or Amelia? Go, please go ahead. <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to, I mean, I, I'm happy to. Um, well, Amelia is the scholar and more the the poet and translator. But um, as Amelia wrote in her book uh, quite well, after the Holocaust, there was a bit of an initial turning inward in Jewish writing and Yiddish poetry. Um, and a sense that, that Jews had been failed by leftist social movements. But it's important to consider the context in which Kerler was uh, writing you know, that he was a refusenik in the Soviet Union um, and that he was very much taking inspiration from the civil rights movement. It wasn't just that he was um, wanting to express um, his, his support for it. He was very much taking inspiration. Um, so I think that that may be um, where you kind of see this willingness on his part to compare American racism and the Holocaust. I don't know if uh, Amelia wants to add a bit to that. Yeah, I mean, my, my sense is that it's, it's the, part of sort of part of the human condition is um, thinking about group, right? Thinking about group suffering, identifying with some group or another. This is something that, that groups do, especially groups that have struggled, groups that have suffered. And I, my, my book focuses on the earlier period, really ends with the Holocaust. But um, I, I think something similar happens after the Holocaust to what was happening in the 1930s, which was a, um, a branching out, an attempt to think about other groups, an attempt to establish bridges to other groups. Uh, but that that's that has to be done from the standpoint of one's own tradition, right? One one writes about what one knows, and uh, it took a while to get to that point again. And you know, for many Jews, I think even now, and this is why I brought up the Alexandra Ocasio Cortez uh, issue. There were there are many Jews who feel that she should not be comparing detention camps to concentration camps. This isn't kosher. We should you know concentration camps are a unique thing. Um, and yet to others' minds, and I'll identify with the latter group, uh, you have to, if you can't compare to the concentration camps to other things, we're at risk of something like that happening again. And so I believe that this experience of the Holocaust, certainly by the late 1950s, the 1960s, um, was one that Jewish writers, that Yiddish writers felt they needed to um, metabolize into something that would, uh, would serve uh, 
would serve human rights more broadly speaking. It's, it's and, curious that you said that Ocasio-Cortez's uh, comparison wasn't kosher when kosher <laughs> slaughter imagery, of course, is brought up very distinctly both in, in Kehler's poem and in another poem that you shared with us earlier. Well, I think Kehler and Ocasio-Cortez are doing the same thing. I'm making that comparison, right? This is that the comparison I'm making. I believe that what she was doing uh, by, I, I'm being ironic. I, I um, it wasn't kosher by some, <laughs> it was denounced. Her statements comparing the two things were denounced by, um, by some as sort of heretical, right? How dare you compare the Holocaust to anything else? And, and I think, <laughs> you know, many decades before, Kehler's doing exactly the same thing. He's comparing uh, the experience of being a Jew, <laughs> the experience of, you know, this history of suffering to what he's seen in history of suffering among black Americans. And he's saying, now, now is my chance. And if I were in Alabama, I'd be cutting through that crowd. And I would be, I would, I would become, it's, it's not enough to be a Jew. I have to be something else as well, right? I would become, I'd become a black man. I think it's also worth remembering, you know, I, we mentioned it before, but um, that obviously talking about the Holocaust was common in Yiddish poetry, but <laughs> you really couldn't do it in the Soviet Union. So in some ways, what's striking about this poem and uh, subversive isn't so much that he's talking about the American civil rights movement, it's that he's talking about the Holocaust. I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't even translate this poem into Russian and publish it in Russian in the Soviet Union. Um, so it's, we always have to keep in mind what a different context he was in, in terms of the country that he lived in, as well as the time period. Thank you for that. So while doing some research for tonight's program, I was delighted to discover that a brochure of Kehler's poetry was translated into English by Elia Palevsky and published in the early 70s by the Workers' Circle. Um, in the previous decade, the 60s, who would have Kehler's audience have been and in what form would they have consumed his work? It seems like his work actually, there was something of a ban on it or that it was um, unable to be read in its original form. W was he able to publish during the 60s or was all of his publishing happening after he had immigrated to Israel? Um, so most of his publishing, well, he had published an initial first book of poetry uh, prior to um, serving in the Gulag. Uh, but after that, he he largely could not publish until he reached Israel in the 70s. And then he published a lot of old older poetry. But he did uh, publish a book called In My Father's Vineyard that was translated into Russian. But he had to pass it off as um, songs of a Nazi ghetto uh, rather than so that people wouldn't know that it, they were poems that had been written in the Gulag. Um, but he was in, you know, in some ways it's a, it's a, an unfortunate time to peak as a Yiddish poet, which is what's after the Holocaust. Um, and while he was in um, the Soviet Union, he did publish a bit abroad. Um, and he did, you know, his play caught the attention of some very prominent American writers like Arthur Miller, who advocated for allowing him to immigrate um, to Israel. Um, but then, you know, when he did get to Israel, there was a community of Yiddish writers there, um, but it was small. And, you know, then he had to contend with the prejudice towards the Yiddish language that's in Israel. Um, but. So, as was the case in our previous program about the play Mississippi, there are certain issues of distance between the author of the work, a Jewish poet in the USSR, and his subject, uh, the Black people of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, Maya, I'm curious if you could unpack what those issues of distance look like in this poem and whether that affected your approach and how you translated it. Yeah, um, well, I think, as I said before, I, um, I always try to keep in mind um, the, the context in which he was writing, because, uh, you know, he was uh, writing about a country that he hadn't been in um, and uh, 
group of people who um, largely he hadn't um, met. Um, and it's interesting when you when you think about it because a lot of his what he heard about the American civil rights movement would have come through Soviet propaganda, um, but also through uh, Yiddish literature. Um, and um, I forget what I was. It's interesting. Yeah, I was going to say that it's interesting when you when you think about it that um, in the United States, the civil rights movement was very much connected to leftist leftism, so and sympathetic to socialism and at the time, to a certain extent, to communism. Whereas Kerler had been harmed by communism, so it's very interesting to see him uh, bridging that in the poem. Now, I know in the cosmology of phrases that are, uh, and words that would be used to describe Black people in Yiddish, um, Negro would probably be the closest contemporary word that would be used to describe um, Black people and consistently used to, to describe Black people in this poem. What were some of the choices that you made as a translator in order to sort of update the nature of the poem so it didn't feel like it was too distant from the expression of the present time? Yeah, well, I definitely didn't want to go with Negro because I felt like, um, as I as I said in my original, uh, I think it was a Facebook message to you that it feels a little bit dated. Uh, but it's funny because as I've sort of analyzed this poem since then, there are ways in which it's very modern um, in the way that, um, you know, to Carolair, the civil rights movement wasn't just about, you know, segregation and equality. It was very much a matter of life and death in his poem. So as right now, where we're talking about, you know, Black Lives Matter, it seems very, very fitting for the time. Um, but that's a bit of a tangent. Um, but I very much didn't want to go with Negro because I knew that it would seem old fashioned. And I felt like the poem was already going to seem old fashioned. Um, so black person, black man seemed to be the much uh, better choice. But of course, in, in Yiddish, Schwarzer is more, it's the opposite where these days where Schwarzer, which would be the literal translation of a black person is more of the slur in Yiddish, whereas what's in the poem, which is neger, which is Negro, it's um, the much more polite term in, in Yiddish. Uh, speaking of some of your choices concerning um, the translation, I'd like to look at the usage of some words in the poem in order to get a purchase on what their meaning is or possibly could be in their Jewish context and beyond. In the fourth stanza of the poem, Kerler makes a statement, Kain mol nit, which Maya you've translated as never again a phrase whose documented use, one moment, a phrase whose documented use as a discrete declarative statement in relation to Jewish suffering is first found in Yitzhak Lamdan's 1927 Hebrew language poem, Masada, a historical epic. We know the phrase, never again, as you've translated it, as historically the declaration of self-determination by liberated prisoners of Buchenwald and an anti-fascist watchword against the recurrence of genocide. The particular Yiddish words in the poem, Kain, Mol, and Neat, are of course familiar in the context of Zog Neat Kain Mol, the famous song of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. In the present day opinion of many people, it is a phrase expressly tied to the memory of the Holocaust when it was used um, in 2018 by a survivor of the Parkland shooting, a digital communication specialist tweeted that it bothered her, quote, because many Jews strongly associate that phrase with the Holocaust specifically. For a second, it felt like cultural appropriation, but I doubt the kids knew this or did it intentionally, unquote. The only tweet in response to this says, quote, even if unintentional, offensive, unquote. Yet in the poem, there seems to be almost a shadow of this sentiment wedged between Kerler's experience as a Jew in the Soviet Union and the experience of Black people in the Jim Crow South. What was the currency of a declaration like never again 
in the context of careless poetry? And what do you think it was intended to mean in the, in the context of the poem? Yeah, so um, it should be noted that it, in the original poem, he just says never. And I translated it as never again, uh, because I think that in the, in the context, it was clear that that was um, what he was going for. Um, but a different translator might have translated it differently than I did. I felt that never again uh, would speak most strongly to the American modern ear. Can I just um, pipe in? I want to pipe in and just I, I really appreciate your translation of that because I think you needed to put in that I think you needed to put in that signpost um, to identify this as a poem that could be read as a poem about the Holocaust. So I think it was absolutely the right the right decision. And I also wanted to just draw attention to something that although it's not you know kein mon male right it's den toit an kein kein mon niet but then he goes on in, in the next line to write niet umgekehrt wird sein die Zeit right will not mm -hmm. return, <laughs> that, time, that time will not return again. Yeah. Uh, so they, in spirit, it's, um, you know, very much along those lines of, you know, never again shall Matsada be taken over, never again shall, you know, the, the, the Holocaust happen and so forth. So its orientation as a statement is almost towards the Holocaust or in relationship to the Holocaust. Um, yeah, I think that's very clear in the poem. Um, but I think, as, as I said before, you always have to keep in mind um, the context. Um, you know, when people talk about, um, you know, the, the Parklands kids using the phrase, you know, that's that's in, you know, our decade and our century, whereas <laughs> Carroller was writing, again, in a time in a country where, you know, he wasn't really even allowed to acknowledge the Holocaust. Um, so it's just, it's, his poem is subversive in a way that's totally different than the way that we're kind of inclined to read it. Um, but, and then um, there was another slide, like I think it's very clear in the poem that this, this death that searches for him anywhere that's mentioned in the poem, it, it's the same death that led to the Holocaust. And he's clear, very clearly, linking it with American racism. Um, and we did have this other slide that I saw that someone tried to put up at some point from a, a poem that's just a few pages later in the same collection where he talks about there being, it's a very clearly a poem about, about the Holocaust. And he talks about there being a monster on the march and he uses the word never forget. Um, so I definitely think that you know, the never again, and if I were in Alabama, he's, clear, he's clearly linking the Holocaust with American racism. This aspect is very fascinating to me because I think what that phrase is supposed to refer to has in a sense sort of ossified, um, there's a sense that in some way it disrespects the memory of the people for whom perhaps it was initially expressed when it is applied to the plight of any other group of people. And here we have um, someone who, who lived um, during the time of the actual Holocaust explicitly using these phrases in order to address the particular plight of Black people. Um, it seems very provocative and the kind of thing that um, would be controversial if it was outside of the context of a Yiddish poem written in the 1960s, which goes to show you that there's a lot more going on in Yiddish than people usually give it credit for, which to some degree is the entire point of this series. Um, mm -hmm. So I thank you so much for bringing that poem in this conversation. Um, if you'll indulge me as a way of giving myself some perspective on where certain segments of the American Jewish community might have been concerning the civil rights movement, institutionally, politically, and otherwise, I drew on some of the in-house resources of the Worker's Circle. So with Noel D'Amico, Worker's Circle Director of Social Justice, I informally interviewed a former president and executive director of the Worker's Circle. And in a monumental task that continues to yield a trove of provocative and interesting findings, social justice associate Jonathan Taubus, 
has made a survey of a worker circle periodical titled The Call, roughly during the years of both the Birmingham campaign and the writing of Careless Poem. What has emerged for me is a complicated picture of the various stances of an American Jewish institution in relationship to the American civil rights movement. Anecdotally, it is caught up in the midst of a diversity of upheavals, attitudes, and approaches. Recent memory of factional conflicts in the organization, including communist factions who eventually decamped to other organizations. There are demographic influxes of refugees at the Holocaust, attitudinal, if not necessarily outspoken opposition to McCarthyism, a spousal of American civil rights and anti-racism as important values among others advocated by the organization, formal and informal analysis of civil rights as a labor issue, and the dispatch of worker circle delegates to the Leadership Council on Civil Rights Conference in the 1960s, which tracks with the institutional status of the worker circle as an ally to organizations working more directly on the issue of American civil rights. There's also various chapters of the worker circle advocating from a kind of geographic and institutional autonomy resulting in actions addressing civil rights in their own constituent communities. A lot of the contemporary documented thinking we have from the worker circle about the civil rights movement is expressed in their periodical, The Call. The January 1963 cover story is titled Civil Rights and Labor, A Call for a Realistic Militancy by Shelley Appleton, who was the VP of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. In this article, he says, quote, on the whole, one must applaud this new Negro assertiveness People who do not respect their own rights are not likely to command the respect of others. He goes on, quote, at the same time, however, one is under no obligations to accept without criticism the excesses of some spokesmen for the Negro community, especially when these excesses are plainly damaging to the cause of civil rights. These excesses, if you're curious, were criticisms from Black leadership about discriminatory practices in portions of the organized labor movement. Criticisms, which the author says, are tantamount to a kind of McCarthyism. The article goes on to broadly support the civil rights movement and calls for the removal of all racist barriers to employment, schools, housing, and other societal institutions. But ultimately, these aims would best be realized through the labor movement. Now, this is only one view among many that were expressed in this publication. In May of the same year, we have, in a takedown of contemporary Jewish neocons, an appeal to the specifically Jewish obligation to address the plight of Black people in the United States. In September, we have an item about New York Worker Circle members with their vice president and administrative director filling two train cars to join the March on Washington, along with delegations of Worker Circle members from various cities on the East Coast. But I want to return to that earlier ultimatum for a quote, realistic militancy in the American civil rights movement, because it's interesting in view of the outpouring, both militant and otherwise, in support of the subsequent movement for Soviet Jewry, both from the worker circle and from the mainstream American Jewish establishment as a whole, the movement taking on the forms, dimensions, and energies of the earlier American civil rights movement. Maya, in a short preface that you wrote for your previous translation of this poem, you connected Kehler's desire to protest in his poem with his eventual identification as a refusenik. What relationship might there have been for Kehler between the American civil rights movement and the later movement for Soviet Jewry? Um, well, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, the Soviet Union capitalized, no, that's not the right word. Um, <laughs> the Soviet Union sort of shone a light on American racism in order to distract from its own um, civil rights, its own civil rights abuses. But that ended up having um, sort of the opposite effect that they wanted to have, which it, which was it inspired the Refusenik movement, who really um, you know took a page from the American Civil Rights Movement. Um, this is if you've ever read um, "When They Come for Us Will Be Gone" by Gal Beckerman that discusses this um, in depth. And then it, on the in the United States. 
there was this effect where um, the organizations that American Jews put into place to help the civil rights movement were later repurposed um, in the fight to help Soviet Jews. So there were um, you know, multiple points of contact. I might just add one thing to that. Um, it's, you know, there was a, there was a kind of Cold War in social justice between the US and the Soviet Union, where the US was constantly shining a light on the anti Semitism of the Soviet Union on, you know, the need of uh, Soviet Jews to be to be allowed to, to immigrate and so forth. And, uh, and the Soviet Union was doing exactly the same thing about Jim Crow in the United States, you know, they were they were shining a spotlight and, um, and I wanted to quote a, uh, a passage from my colleague Stephen Lee's book, The Ethnic Avant Garde, where he, um, he talks about this to, you know, to really interesting effect. Uh, Stephen Lee writes, the Cold War was a struggle not just between the United States and the USSR, but also between these countries, two competing models of equality liberal pluralism versus socialist internationalism. And in fact, much good emerged from this back and forth, namely global scrutiny of Jim Crow and eased immigration for <laughs> Soviet Jews. So, you know, although there was this competition and although there were these horrible inequalities in both places, ultimately the competition was positive in certain regards. There were ways in which the Soviet Union held the United States to account um, and vice versa. So that's an interesting piece that I think is is spotlighted in Carler's poem, where he's using, you know, he's using the civil rights movement. He's really, he's talking about the civil rights movement, but he's also talking to some extent about the experience of Jews in Europe. And he's able to do that by talking about the thing that, that he could talk about in the United States. Um, and this, you know, this, this movement, the fact that there were Soviet Soviet writers, Yiddish, Russian, and and in other languages discussing civil rights was potentially a benefit to the movement to some extent. Obviously, there were complications involved with McCarthyism, but um, but scrutiny can be good in these cases. This is absolutely fascinating because I feel like to a certain extent, like memory of um, the movement for Soviet Jewry, you know, exists very strongly. Um, still uh, as a communal memory, um, but not necessarily the relationship it might have had with the civil rights movement or the way in which the respective movements happened to move amongst the American populace and out into the world. So I'm curious if you could tell me, Maya, what happened to Kayla after the period in which he wrote this poem and how did his work continue to develop once he left the USSR? Um, so he did eventually immigrate to Israel in the early 1970s, um, and there he was able to publish his prior work. So his the first few books that he published in Israel were all work that he had written previously, including poems written in the Gulag. And um, he continued writing poetry, and um, he um, the first book that he published in Israel was called The First Seven Years which I always thought was an interesting choice for a title because it, on the surface, it, it references the first seven years that he had been living in Israel, but also the first seven years of plenty. Um, and that's the following seven years of famine. So he, he definitely didn't have a sense in Israel of being you know, perfectly safe. Um, I've been, th since I translated this poem, I've been thinking a lot about what it would have been like for him to be in Israel because he was there for the arrival of uh, Jews from Ethiopia um, and would have come into contact with, you know, much more diverse, uh, with Jews from, you know, much more diverse backgrounds. Um, and that's very interesting when you think about the context of this poem. And then of course the, the conflict would have changed from the conflict in Russia to the Israel, Israeli Arab conflict. So if I'm not mistaken, Yosef Keller's son, Professor Dov Ber Keller is actually present with us on this call. If you're out there, I'd like to offer my Varame Grusen. Um, so actually all three of us have known him. He put on an amazing spread for me when I visited him at his place in Jerusalem about five years ago as a student of Tel Aviv University's summer Yiddish program. 
I'd like to ask you both, how has access to Dove Bear affected your inter interpretation and relationship with his father's work? Oh, it's been invaluable. It's been so helpful. Um, I write to him frequently with questions and he helps me, um, you know, put uh, poems into context and lines that I'm worrying about. He, he helps me not only with Keraler, but when I'm translating Sutskever and, and other um, writers, he's very giving. I, um, I, I mean, I, it's um, part of the question you're asking is just, um, you know, how, how is it, um, what does it mean to have access, to have inside access to a poem that you're trying to interpret and, uh, and I'm of the school that believes that all access is, is good, that you want to take advantage of absolutely everything. There are certainly those who interpret poetry who would say, interpret it on your own, try not to get any inside information. Um, I think especially when we're unearthing a piece of history, a moment in history that's, that's maybe starting to slip away, the Soviet 1960s, uh, any, um, uncomfortable information about the writing of the poem, uh, you know, side, uh, you know, side stories about who the poet's neighbor happened to be is, is useful because we're trying to put ourselves into that position that's almost impossible to understand for someone who, you know, like me anyway, is born in California and learned Russian and Yiddish as a, uh, you know, as an adult. I think that's really important to sort of try to recover what the, in a sense, physical experience of that was because already um, nostalgia is coming for that Soviet period um, that's expressed both politically and culturally in various sort of hipster spaces. Um, I think it's really important to have more insight, especially about life in that particular period. Um, so Martin Luther King Jr.'s chief of staff, Wyatt T. Walker, called the 1963 Birmingham campaign, quote, the chief watershed of the nonviolent movement in the United States, marking the maturation of a national force in the civil rights arena of the land. Yet, as we know, a mere three years after Kayla's poem was written, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. The frustration of Black people with a lack of material improvement in jobs, housing, education, and politics in the wake of the civil rights movement began to coalesce around the Black power movement whose visions of actualized ethnic and communal self-determination continue to invigorate American movement organizing to this very day. The ethnic borders of solidarity enshrined in Kaler's poem are poignant as visceral evocations of bodies caught in the toils of a societal oppression. As a black Jew, I present myself as proof that those ethnic borders are permeable, but still I hail this poem as a present day appeal for black Jewish and black Jewish bodies to continue to assemble together for the purposes of human and civil rights. All attendees of tonight's program will be receiving an email shortly with information and resources addressing this issue in addition to a link to a recording of tonight's program and more engaging work from our guests. If you have enjoyed tonight's program, please tell your friends and family and visit us at circle.org. I'd like to invite those who might have questions for our guests to remain on this call for an informal Q&A session immediately following tonight's program. And I'm hoping that Dove Bear Keller will join us there as well. My thanks to our guests this evening, Maya Ivrona and Amelia Glazer, for what has been a fascinating conversation on a poem, two movements, and a life. In two weeks time, we will have the third and final program in this Worker Circle three-part series in the midst titled Report and Reverberation, Fault Lines of Race in the Yiddish Press, featuring author Tony Michaels and anti-racism educator Jonah Boyarn for a look at the diverse contents of writings on race in the Yiddish language press. Maya and Amelia, I was curious if there was any kind of closing impressions you wanted to give us on this particular work. I, yeah, I, I will say something. I mean, I, I think what, um... I think what this, this work helps us to get to is a question about the possibility of solidarity. And that's something that you've brought up a couple of times tonight, Anthony, in discussing, I mean, even just in your, in your last comments about the yielding of Martin Luther King Jr.'s moment to, to Black power. And, and it's, it, you know, it's mirrored in a slightly different form in the yielding of internationalism to 
a, um, a return to thinking about Jewishness with World War II. Um, so how is, you know, is solidarity possible? And what I think is really interesting about this poem is that Carler is developing a language that um, describes this very liminal space between um, the possibility of uh, understanding someone else's pain and the necessity of thinking about one's own pain. It's something that the scholar Michael Rothberg has talked about in his book, The Implicated Subject, which came out about a year ago. Um, and I, I think um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a complicated, it's a complicated poem in that he has um, he has multiple multiple interests that he that he he puts in there. He puts kind of puts everything in there. The um, the desire to the desire to be in Alabama, um, the safety in not being in Alabama, uh, the the desire to be somewhere else <laughs> besides where he is, which might also be suggested. Um, and and what does it mean to kind of remain in our skin, but also try to imagine being in someone else's? And I think this is the sort of conversation that's worth continuing to have, possibly partly using the poetry of the past. Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me on and for um, spotlighting this poem. And, and, you know, it's so inspiring that we're talking about this um, poem that was, you know, written um, in the 60s in Yiddish and it feels uh, so timely right now. Um, it was just a coincidence that, that the Yiddish Book Center happened to publish it that week of the protests. But of course, you know, there's always some unfortunate reason why writing like this feels timely in the United States. Um, but yeah, I'm so glad that, that we're talking about it and that, you know, Yiddish poetry has so much to say. I found it particularly moving at the particular point at which you sent it to me because I felt like I had the physical experience of wanting to be where protest was happening and not being able to do that as someone yeah. who was distinctly at, at risk um, for co contracting the coronavirus. So it was a very unusual poem where I was able to read it as a careler being in the USSR and wanting to be in Alabama and me being at home and also wanting to be where the world of protest was. I really want to thank you, Amelia and Maya, for this wonderful conversation. My name is Anthony Morgesi Russell, and this has been Familiarity and Distance, Yosef Keller's Vinich Volt in Alabama Zion. Good night. Okay, so I believe this is the time in which we would have our impromptu q and I know we have some some questions here in um, the Q&A box. Let's see. So we have someone at, uh, talking about Kurtz's Kaddish, which I believe was a poem that you had brought up, Amelia Glazer. Yeah, and it, it's a quite long poem. I translated it in full in my um, in my book, which just came out, Songs in Dark Times. There's a little plug for my <laughs> for my book. Yeah. Um, my 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 editor will be happy. So uh, yeah, uh, Quartz's Kaddish. Also, isn't this a secular Jew acknowledging religious expression in both religions? Um, yeah, wow, that's that's so. Uh, Absolutely. Um, this is a secular Jew who, I mean, Kurtz is really fascinating. He actually grew up in a Lubavitcher family in Vitebsk. He ran away from home as a teenager and joined the circus as a hairdresser and made his way to the United States where he became a communist and became a poet and then start became sort of the leading poet in the proletarian American writers movement. Um, so he was not religious and he makes the point of saying that in the poem and yet it's a religious poem. It's about the Kaddish. And so often I see not only in Kurtz's writing, but in other Yiddish poets' writings, this return to um, religious tropes to mean something different, right? The borrowing of Jewish tropes and the application of those tropes to something that they were not designed for, whether it's the application of a kind of Holocaust poem or Jewish mourning to civil rights. Um, in this case, he's, he's writing about the four young black girls who are killed in a church bombing. Um, so it's, Kaddish is very appropriate. Um, or, you know, you also see this, this replacement of, uh, you know, of religion with, with social justice, 
and you see him you see him doing that and he brings together in the longer poem he brings together you know rabbis and you know side by side you have you know these black mourners and these jewish mourners and everybody's mourning and it's one big you know one big moment of mourning and that's what's important right now that we're all sad together uh so yes i think that religion does play a, an important role in in some of this this poetry Dober uh, said, there's absolutely nothing kosher in using challah on Agreed. human beings. Yeah, if you notice me suddenly I, smile for no reason. <laughs> it was because I, I saw that. I very <laughs> much agree. And yet I think it's also sort of a really interesting sort of set of images about um, Jewish death and sanctity. And it, it sort of happening in a, in a kind of quasi ritual context, I think about sort of every year for, uh, I believe it's Yom Kippur that we do the martyrology. So we in very, uh, Jews in, in very stark detail kind of outline the various ways in which uh, various lights of, of Jewish thought and religion have, have died. Like we talk about how they became martyrs and like how they were set on fire, hot combs or run over their skin. So there's a sort of like way in which that sort of suffering, suffering is enshrined and it feels like kind of by invoking this language of kosher slaughter, it has in some kind of way a relationship with those sort of loom of, of, of images. And I'm only able to give you that kind of information because I'm a rabbit's and if I wasn't, you know, if I wasn't the husband of a rabbi who was sitting there in shul constantly taking notes, I probably wouldn't be able to have as much information about things like the martyrology. Um, I'll give a little shout out to my uh, a recent graduate student who just finished, Julia uh, Fermented Seisler, who actually wrote a dissertation on um, animal slaughtering and kosher meat as an imagery in various social justice movements in, uh, in Jewish literary tradition, that there's a certain tradition of bringing up the, uh, the you know, the, the horrible, the cruel butchering of, um, of animals and then using that terminology to translate to uh, the utterly cruel butchering of human beings. And in this poem, in this poem by Yosef Kerler, you see um, the use of animal imagery, not only in the Khalif, but also in kneeing before an animal or before a beast. Um, so I was curious if that was actually uh, um, an allusion to the golden calf or kind of barbarism or ideas of, of like, it seemed like such an unusual image to introduce at that particular time. Um, I was wondering if that was kind of uh, an example of, 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 of barbarism being attached to the people who, who you know, to the, Ku, to the Ku Klux Klan and the various people who are, who are causing the oppression or whether there was kind of an even more sort of complicated image in there. Do you, Anthony, would you, um, are, are you in control of the, um, of the slides? I wonder if I'm, we can pull back up, whoever is I'm controlling. not, but I believe Danielle, Danielle is still in. Ah, thank you, Danielle. Right, so, um, I'm sorry, am I using that wrong uh, slideshow? What am I trying to pull up again? Uh, the, sorry, the original poem in Yiddish, the Kerler there. poem in Yiddish. Oh, the Kerler poem, the, the end thing, this one? Yes. Awesome. I will full screen that. There's, so there's a line, right, this, it begins, it's the stanza that begins, Mitch Fatso and Mitch Weiss alight. And then he goes on to say, uh, it's a little bit, um, a little bit further. Yeah, it's the first line, I think, in, the, in, this, in this particular. Yes, here we go, uh, right here. Yeah, the, the first stanza, line four, Ven Mensch Fachayachat Geknit. So this reference to the, you know, um, man bowing down before a, you know, an animal, a beast, uh, which I interpret to mean any number of times when that has happened <laughs> in history. The Chaya could be Hitler, the Chaya could be the, you know, the, the, huh. the lynch mob, um, or, or of course it could be some sort of golden calf. Right. So uh, Jordan Hirsch, who's a friend of mine, uh, has a question here. Uh, he's noting that Yevtushenko was not Jewish. He's asking, do you think that his writing about Babi Yar and the specific use of Russian and Soviet anti-Semitism was a direct impetus to Kerala writing about injustice aimed at a group to which he did not belong? 
definitely seems like it was an inspiration. I and mean, I imagine that, um, yeah, <laughs> I think so. Um, I mean, it might've been, you know, you never really know what's going to trigger a poem, but it's it's clear that Carler had read this and that maybe he had been thinking about, you know, the marches in Alabama and, you know, the poem sprang up. Rosa. But I still think it's, I, I still think it's interesting <laughs> that in Carler's poem, it's, you know, it's not enough that I am a Jew. And then in Yevtushenko's poem, it's, being a Jew makes me a true a true Russian. A true Russian, yes. Yeah, and then it also reminds me of that that line um, by the Russian poet. She's her name is like on the tip of my tongue. Marina Tsvetaeva. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That all poets are Jews. You know. Um, right. Yeah. So I see a very detailed um, comment from Rosa Lang Levitsky, who's talking about kind of the complicated nature of political alignment in the worker circle, both uh, in, in the mid century and after. And I want to say that this is a very interesting, and very complicated history. There's a distinct possibility that we might actually be talking about it to some degree in, in a future worker circle program. And Toback has come on the call. So how would you like to address that? Oh, I, I was just smiling. Um, you know, we're a 120 year old organization and um, I think we have to accept our entirety of our history. There was a socialist and communist divide and we were very much on the socialist side. And uh, later on, I, I, you see in the 1960s, um, I'm very proud that worker circle members were a part of the civil rights movement. So I think we could have an entire conversation about it, but I think organizations like ours have to own um, that it's com there's complications in our past and it's worth mentioning and respecting and, and evaluating as part of the whole. We have to look at our history for inspiration and also in some points as a cautionary tale. So, um, that's my short answer. Thank you for that. Sorry, uh, another friend of mine, Jerry Tenney has a question, so I'm trying to kind of type it <laughs> to him. I know he wants to share some historical information about the particular time and the writer. So um, Jerry, actually, if you wouldn't mind um, sharing that in the, in the Q and A box, that would be great. I would love to hear what you have to say. Um, let's see. So, uh, Louise Pasek has a question. The works published in Israel, were they published in Hebrew or in Yiddish? If I'm not mistaken, I've already encountered uh, some of his work that was specifically um, earmarked as being originally in, in Yiddish that he published when he was in Israel. So I'm assuming it was primarily in, in Yiddish. So he continued writing in Yiddish, uh, but some of his work was translated into Hebrew. But, uh, the, you know, the big um, change when he got to Israel was that he could finally publish in Yiddish, whereas he couldn't in the Soviet Union. Okay. So uh, Sarah Biskowitz has a question. Um, she says, I'm reading Dr. Glazer's book and fascinated by her discussion of passwords in leftist Yiddish literature, born from linguistic and cultural exchange and used by Yiddish writers to show solidarity with other groups. I'm wondering if she could discuss um, if the recent work around translating Black Lives Matter into Yiddish, which Anthony Russell co-led, that's true, um, and if and how it can be used as a password, as a parallel to the earlier leftist Yiddish solidarity she discusses in her recent book. Um, thank you so much for reading my book. That, that makes me happy. So uh, yeah, I um, Black Lives Matter is a passphrase. It was on the word. It's, Three words, but it's a, it's a passphrase, and um, and I did read I read Anthony's piece in Jewish Currents, and and you know it's a, it's an interesting um, it question, right? This this question of how we translate these things back into Yiddish. Um, I uh, I guess I'll say that there were a lot of phrases, but part of part of what a password is for me is is an untranslatable. What a um, you know some scholars. Uh, uh, Barbara Kassian and others have called untranslatables, right? Terms that are so meaningful 
in, in themselves that they make their way into other languages as they are. And these are words like, um, you know, uh, Scottsboro, <laughs> right? You're obviously not going to translate the name of a place, but No Pasaran during the Spanish Civil War was set right into Yiddish poems as No Pasaran. Um, you know, uh, Angelo Herndon must not die was sometimes tran not translated, but just transliterated into Yiddish characters because those were words that were spoken so often in the American English context that a Yiddish writer would recognize them more in uh, English than in Yiddish. So it's an interesting task to translate that kind of passphrase into another language when it's so meaningful in its original, uh, in, it, in its original phrase. But I don't, I don't know if Anthony, you want to pick up on that a bit and, and talk a bit about your own, your own. I'm, I'm just fascinated by the fact that No Pasaran was actually uh, transliterated as such in Yiddish poetry. When I included that example as where I was coming from when I said that, when I advocated that uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, might exist in the Yiddish language as Black Lives Matter. Um, I just used that as, as a random suggestion. I had no idea if there was a pre-existing history in, in Yiddish of, of, their, of that phrase kind of existing in Yiddish poetry as is. I think it's an untranslatable. I kind of do. I mean, I think it's, and, and I think you see it in other languages. We, we talked a little bit earlier tonight, or Maya was talking about this choice of how to, how to translate nego, which is the appropriate term for a Black person at the time that this poem was being written in Yiddish, right. what would the appropriate term be now? Is it more appropriate to be historical and use whatever was appropriate in English at the time, which would be Negro, or would it be more appropriate to update it? You know, Black man, Black person. Uh, and you see in, in you know, French, for example, uh, the oh, Black. Oh yeah, there's, right? there's, there's, there's so, entire episodes of, I think, Rough Translation, which is an NPR uh, podcast about these various movements over the past couple of years about how to translate Black into French in a way that really acknowledges the diversity of what being Black is without being beholden to an American identity, but also not being beholden to a colonist framing of, of what Blackness is. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And even actually, even going back to the 1930s in Russia, you have, uh, for example, the, um, the film by Ivan Ivanov, Black and White, which is based on a Mayakovsky poem that had been translated by Langston Hughes <laughs> into English. And the poem was just, the, sorry, the, the film, this five minute animation film was just transliterated. The title was transliterated because Black and White would have been understandable to a Russian audience at the time. So uh, I have uh, a comment here or a question rather from Phyllis Gorfein, or I would say Gorfein if I was pronouncing it after the Yiddish fashion. Um, today, I think a poet claiming that he is black as well as a Jew would seem presumptuous. Okay, well, there's the there is the distinct possibility of people who are both black and Jewish. Let me just put that out there. Um, but I think I know what you're saying. Uh, probably that a, po a, a poet a white Jewish poet claiming that they were black would be seen as presumptuous and perhaps appropriation. Was there a sense in Russia, was there a sense of that in Russia in the 1960s? Would there have been such a sense in the 1960s in the US? Like how transgressive was this sort of, um, this form of projection, um, I guess, in, culturally at the time? I'm trying to think of an example um, because I feel like, um, you know, I, I, completely I, I completely understand that. And that was part of the reason I thought initially that the poem read in a, in a way that was a bit dated. Mm -hmm. um, but actually now that we've had this conversation and we've talked about Svetayeva saying that all poets are Jews, Maybe Carolyn was also coming from a, a place where, you know, people were also used to, to people identifying with Jews saying, you know, that we are all Jews or um, I don't know. Um, but I mean, I, th I think that not, not having been alive in the 60s, I'm not, I'm not sure. I feel like it's more of a, you know, of the modern critical eye that we've that we've um, come to have for this kind of language. Mm 
maybe that that we've evolved to the point where we're more critical of declarations like this. Right, where this might have this might have existed in contemporary time as as like you know a, 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 a heartbreaking act of solidarity, but now it seems a little. But I, I think we need to think about what appropriation means, right? What is you know I I thought a lot about this in terms of my poets in the nineteen my poets they're my poets uh, the poems that, that I'm writing about in the nineteen thirties as well because you know it, it, I think I think it's appropriative if you're taking something. And if you're not, you know, if you are, let's say, pretending to be black so that you can get fellowships that are designed to encourage more black academics, that would be appropriation. Um, is it that has happened recently in an academic indeed. setting. Um, yeah. Would it be appropriation, though, to imagine yourself while still acknowledging what your own background and identity is? I'm trying to do someone else's shoes. Right, it strikes me as very nuanced. I think at a very, you know, at a very kind of first glance reading, it feels awkward, but I think when you go through the lines, it has a lot of nuance. He is fully sort of embodying where he is in the space between him and what he's talking about, but he's just like in that space. Um, you know both where he is and where he wants to be. Um, so Dove Bear Kerler has his hand up. I'm wondering if there's any possible way we could include him, um, at least by camera, in our conversation. Let me see. Is it Danielle? Is there any or um, Jorge? Is there any possible way for us to to get Dove Bear sort of? I can move him into the other room. Just give me a sec. Okay. I'm also wrestling a very jumpy kitty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is a very Hamish uh, Q and A. So, like you know, cats are cats are good. My child almost just broke. Oh, we have Dove Bear. He's been beamed in to the participant forum. Oh Hi, Dove Bear. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. You're you're muted, Dove Bear. If you can just unmute yourself. Ah, here you are. You're muted. Story of my life. Um, <laughs> Thank you for an amazing presentation. It's uh, not every poet, <laughs> uh, li well, lives, I can't say lives, but experiences such an interest so many years after his disappearance from this world. It's uh, remarkable. And my father made a number of appearances posthumously in Poland, in, in Polish, in Ukrainian, in Russian, more than Russian, not so much. Um, and now also thanks to my in English, and this is really remarkable. Now, what um, what uh, uh, Emilia said about uh, knowing as much as possible is a definitely a valid point because since the last, I think, 25 or so years, I'm doing some work as a poet myself. I, I, I believe I know what goes into poetry. Uh, and uh, I'm not the first one to say it. Of course, it was said before by Akhmatov and others. Everything goes into poetry. And, 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 and it's, a, it's a, a lot of real stuff goes into poetry. Unlike, unlike well, in fiction too, but there are, there's an amazing amount of real things that, you, that the poet experiences that go into, into, into the poetry itself, which cannot be deciphered eventually because uh, things being forgotten. Now, in this particular case, I do happen to know a little bit of the background because I was already around. I was about five years old. And uh, I, to the best, the best of my ability, I believe that I remember that a number of poems, well, I certainly remember one poem that wasn't included by censorship in the Russian collection that uh, was published in 1965. But I believe that I heard the phrase, that's not enough that I'm a Jew, I also have to be a black person, as something that was perceived to be inadmissible to be printed. So I suspect that the poem was translated. Uh, and maybe one day we'll find it, uh, right, uh, the translation. Uh, but it was, not it, was, it was deemed inadmissible as some other poems uh, to be published in Russian. It was probably... Um translated by by dint of the fact that it was eventually censored you're saying that the censors had yes, to be able exactly. to understand it in their own language in order to know that they wanted to censor it 
Exa yeah, exactly. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Now I that I know already from a later period is that simply by knowing history, I was too young to remember it. If Tushenko's poem that was published in 61 was a tremendous event in the Soviet Union, to such an extent that, that the editor of the so-called Literatura Gazeta, that was considered to be the literary newspaper originally established by Pushkin and then re-established by Gorky, um, which was a very politicized, and even today it's a very politicized, uh, today, today it's actually a conservative uh, uh, newspaper. Uh, so the editor said, told Yvtushenko, we will publish it, but before we publish it, I have to consult with my wife because clearly I'll be fired. And he consulted with his wife and they decided that he'll do it. And he was fired. So his career was really tarnished. It was a major thing to be an editor of Literatura de Gazette at the time. So he's a true hero. And it was very much, in, uh, it was reverberating definitely until 63 and even into 65. So, uh, and also my, my father's personal relationship with, with Yvtushenko as a, as, as a senior teenager, not, if, not my father, but Yvtushenko, right? Who looked up at my father as a professional published poet. Uh, he was his neighbor, uh, played a role as well. So uh, that's important to know these things. Uh, now there is something that I happen to know uh, again from later period is that in 1963, my father was not a refusenik yet. There were no refusniks. The refusnik started to appear in 69. Right. So the fact that my father became, our family became refusniks in 1965 already. Um, this is when we got the per permit to leave and then it was canceled, uh, which was unheard of even the Soviet reality, uh, whether, whether at the time or the earlier, uh, the later periods. Um, but my father was, very much non-Soviet already. And he was very friendly with what used to be called the democratic movement, which later was dubbed as dissidents. He had great connections there and he really sympathized with them. He didn't want to participate in it because he became a Zionist already in Vorkuta when he was in prison in the Gulag. And he simply wanted to leave for Israel. That was, he claimed it's not a good thing for Jews to double the national politics. Um, so that was his line. Uh, but he was very much symp symp sympathizing with them and he was sharing the literature, the forbidden literature and, 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 and helping along, all kinds of things like that. So also he was not barred from publishing. He, the moment he submitted papers to, uh, to, to the authorities to asking for permission to leave in 1965, something like a few months after the book was the Russian, the second Russian book was published, uh, he, uh, he voluntarily stopped publishing in the Soviet Shameland and he decided he will never publish anything in the Soviet Union anyway. So in a way, he, he was the one who the, the site, to, to decide to quit. So that, that's important. But that would have been in Russian translation, right? Russian translation is a different thing, right? Yeah, but Russian translation did not allow him to, to publish this poem about if I were in Alabama, because that should have been a kosher poem, you know, because it was, the, the press was full about the atrocities that were happening in, 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 in the capitalist America at the time, right? So, and that definitely uh, in, that impacted them as well. Uh, but even that would be part because the, 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 the way he spoke about it, that because it's not enough I am a Jew, right? I also want to be a black man. Um, I, I also have to be a black man. So that's important to, um, so, so he couldn't publish it. I actually checked, there is a very nice bibliography of uh, Soviet Yiddish authors that published in Poland, because in Poland there were two, uh, there was a newspaper called Stimme and something like uh, Yiddish Schriften, I think. And uh, the, Soviet, the Soviet writers could publish there. Not everybody was afraid to send it because Poland was a satellite state, right? It was a, a socialist country. Also closer to the, so the West. I, yeah, I, sense, yeah, I couldn't find it here, unfortunately. I thought maybe I'll find it. Maybe it was published in, in Folkstimme, but it, I, I, according to this bibliography, which is quite detailed, it wasn't. Um, so 
that's true. The, 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 this this poem, which was supposed to be so kosher in the Soviet reality, uh, was published only in Israel. But this poem is also part of a whole cycle, which actually talks about these things. And and and, and this cycle gives the name to the entire collection in Russian, which which says, "I want to be, I want to be." Nice, or I want to be kind. Or in Russian, and the idea of that poem is that I really want to be a good person, but they don't let me. And then uh, to, to end up, I would like to add that this idea about animals, um, uh, and, and animals enslaving or fighting or killing humans, uh, of course, animals simply means humans who behave like animals. My father has a very famous poem that he wrote in, uh, also in prison uh, that uh, it says something like uh, the animal when the animal is imprisoned is restless, it wants to break the through and so on and, you know, it cannot. but human being uh, and he can't because you know humans close them in and the human being is not like an animal, he knows that it's impossible to get out it's impossible to get out, so he just sits and, and just walks around, but he's not fighting it because there's nothing you can do when animals keep you in prison. Uh, so right? the, so this is the, the animal. Who the animal is yeah. moves from being the person who's imprisoned to yeah. the prisoners. But I, so I, I, would, I, I would like to put it together. It, it's, it's extremely important to know. The, the more we can know, the better it is to understand the, the poem. But it really is amazing. Uh, so we we, we, we uh, can't know about what happened to Sapo, right? So. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but but if we can, we, we have to try. Uh, on one hand, that, that's 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 very important. On the other hand, it's important to look at other poems of the same poet uh, uh, to see because you know the motifs are repeated, and that actually helps to understand what animals means in this context for for Joseph Campbell. Animals are humans who use caliph against other humans, which is which makes them animals. They stop being animals. This has been such a privilege to have you on this call and to have you at this program. And I really want to express um, my gratefulness to you to giving us these insights in the context of this program and my very sincere wish that, you know, I'll, I'll be perhaps in Jerusalem again someday and you'll put on an entire spread um, for me. I hope to be in Jerusalem too. <laughs> Be'ez or Hashem, as they say. Um, so it's 8.33, and I think um, I'm going to bring this program to a close, but there's been so many amazing questions that I wish we had time for, and I know um, that we've actually been considering whether we should have separate programs just for the questions, because we have an hour and 15 minutes of talking about all these really interesting, extremely pertinent and provocative things that are happening in Yiddish culture. And then it's like it's over um, when there really should be a much longer conversation. So there's a possibility I might be exploring, um, you know, longer sessions to engage with everything um, that we've been talking about. And Toback is saying we should definitely continue. I don't know if that means tonight or <laughs> or if that means programmatically in general. Um, but I, I know that I do have to. I, in the future, yes. I know that I do have to leave because as, as, as an aforementioned Rebbitson, I, I have to try to get some dinner on this evening for my husband who will be walking home in the snow very much like the rabbis of old um, in Mizrek, Europa. So thank you so much, um, everyone, for coming to this program. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you so much, Dov Bear, for giving us Thank you, guys. Um, Thank you. that You're information. Amazing. As I said before, in two weeks' time, we will have the third and final program in this Worker Circle three-part series in the midst, titled Report and Reverberation Fault Lines of Race in the Yiddish Press, featuring author Tony Michaels and anti-racism educator Jonah Boyarn for a look at the diverse contents of writings on race in the Yiddish language press. It's going to be very interesting because there are all kinds of things in the Yiddish press that you will be surprised to find in, in, in a number of different directions. We will go over that. And hopefully I will see you then. Everyone, thank you so much for joining thank you us. Very much. Have a good night. Thank you so much for putting this together, Anthony. This was great. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for doing this. Thank nice you. To see you after. <laughs>